Hello and welcome to week 7 and lesson 3 of the NPTEL MOOCs course on development research methods. Continuing with the operationalization aspects of development research methods, in today's class let us uh, discuss about uh, gender analysis and some of the gender sensitive indicators which have these days become integral to development studies and development studies research. Now, let me begin by saying uh, with the help of this slide here that the theoretical, theoretical perspectives on, on uh, women today have changed in a number of ways and influence development cooperation with methodological implications for how uh, women in development and gender relations are addressed in development studies. The, some of the examples of how these theoretical perspectives have changed are showing on your slide now. For example, uh, we have moved from an undifferentiated population of women to the relationship between men and women that is from women in development to gender perspectives which incorporate social relations and differentiation between women and men and between women. So, which means that not all women and not, not all men are equal. Uh, similarly, from we have also moved from the single role of women as reproducers to the triple role of women that is with roles of reproductive, productive and community managing work. We have also moved from different approaches which I will elaborate in small, in small details uh, 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 subsequently, we have moved from uh, the approaches of women in development to gender and development and therefore, from practical gender needs to strategic gender needs. We have also moved from women seen as victims to women seen as actors and agents from a top down to a bottom up perspective and the unit of analysis has changed from an emphasis on the individual woman and the household to socially and ethnically distinct groups of women and men and the relations between them. So, given this context in today's class we will look at some of the issues surrounding uh, the operationalization issues surrounding uh, ge uh, gender analysis or when we make uh, gender analysis integral to our development research uh, question. So, what we will cover in today's class is as follows, we will first look at uh, uh, what does this movement from uh, women in development to gender mainstreaming, gender equality or gender and development mean. Uh, we will also look at gender analysis and some of the approaches to gender mainstreaming. Although I will not go into the details of gender mainstreaming, uh, many of these uh, things have been covered in some of the earlier uh, MOOCs courses. For example, uh, students interested might like to go through some of the lectures on uh, the NPTEL MOOCs course on uh, growth and development, uh, which has elaborate discussions on uh, gender budgeting and gender mainstreaming and so on. In this class, we will also highlight on some of the gender sensitive indicators surrounding the issues of poverty and power and uh, also look at some of the contesting perspectives with respect to mainstreaming and uh, women's empowerment. Now, let us uh, first uh, try and understand this movement from uh, women in development to gender mainstreaming. Now, over a period of time, the, there have been changing approaches to women in development and this has been illustrated uh, through an interdependence between various theories and methods in uh, research. For example, the UN system has promoted gender issues through global summits and gender policies, gender training materials and so on. Uh, there has been a con large contribution, significant contribution of various gender analysts and feminist researchers. Uh, for example, Naila Kabir, uh, uh, Geeta Sen, Mary Anderson uh, towards adoption of gender mainstreaming and uh, women's empowerment in international development cooperation by multilaterals, bilateral agencies and NGOs. Now, it is here that let me also give you a sense of uh, what does this movement from uh, women in development to gender and development approaches mean. There is plenty of literature in this area now WID to GAD. Now, basically in the 1960s and the 1970s, a number of literature came out which said, which uh, talked about the uh, prevalence of poverty among uh, different individuals across the world or the population that is inhabiting in poverty. And it was found that a large sections of the population, if we, if we enter into a gender disaggregated analysis with, re with regard to poverty, it was found that uh, more women than men were uh, found to be living in an impoverished stage. And therefore, uh, there uh, came in a concept which was referred to as feminization of poverty 
or uh, and also it was also found that more women and children uh, were in impoverished state than uh, men in poverty and therefore uh, various uh, associated concepts came in with regard to intra household distribution of resources and whether household as a unit of analysis uh, uh, is uh, should be taken up for further research or we should focus on individuals as a unit of analysis such that the intra household distribution of resources can be properly captured in development research questions. Now, it is during this time that various feminists and uh, various other agents of development, international development agencies came up with the concept of women in development. Therefore, focusing on welfare programs and various other interventions that could lead towards uh, bringing or pulling women out of the, uh, out of the situation of impoverishment. Uh, however, with time uh, this approach was criticized and uh, therefore, uh, the concept of gender and development came up which started challenging the stereotypical notions of uh, the gender roles provided to men and women in households and therefore, came the concepts of what is referred to as practical gender needs and strategic gender needs. So, the women in development approach focused more on practical gender needs and the gender and development approach focused more on uh, strategic gen gender needs. These are some things that we will see in uh, small details in some time. So, the dominant gender analysis frameworks reflect uh, empirical evidence from development cooperation in different societies over the years. And uh, the gender discourse as I just mentioned has transitioned from WID to GAD and uh, you also see it, it is in this context that you see various uh, world conferences on women. For example, the United Nations fourth world conference on women in Beijing in 1995 adopted the Beijing platform for action with global agreement that gender equality is the goal, mainstreaming gender equality is the strategy. Uh, so, with respect to mainstreaming gender equality, we have uh, various concepts such as gender budgeting uh, which, uh, which makes, uh, uh, which, which is one of the examples of how uh, gender related budgets can be made and gender mainstreaming can take place. So, the mainstreaming strategy basically aim to situate gender equality issues at the center of broad policy decisions, institutional structures and resource allocations with respect to development goals and processes. Now, there are two main perspectives with regard to gender mainstreaming strategies. Uh, one is mainstreaming strategies with respect to incorporating gender policies into conventional pro project and program work. For example, providing affirmative action with respect to uh, women uh, being brought into the fore with, uh, from, a, from a policy uh, focus. And uh, the second perspective was with, re with respect to agenda setting which uh, or strategies which aim to create the conditions under which women and men can challenge conventional patterns and structural inequalities and start to redefine uh, gender uh, initiatives. Now, um, as I was saying that there are different policy approaches, uh, uh, different uh, approaches to uh, to centralizing gender equality and women's issues in development research questions and particularly with respect to the third world women, uh, there have been uh, different policy approaches over a period of time international development cooperation or international development agencies, development practitioners have come up with, a, with numerous approaches and it is difficult to summarize them all into one slide. However, an attempt can be made to look at some of the important policy focuses with respect to how, uh, how develop, international development uh, agencies have approached third world women. Now, let us make an attempt here. Uh, so, in this slide, uh, we have made this division with respect to uh, the, uh, the uh, progress in approaches on the heads of issues, welfare, equity, anti-poverty, efficiency and empowerment. Uh, at the uh, uh, bottom of this uh, matrix, you would see uh, my uh, reference to PG and the practical gender needs focusing on women in development approach and SGN or strategic gender needs uh, focusing on gender and development approach. So, PGN basically are needs that are identified by women and men which arise out of the customary gender division of labor. For example, uh, in the customary gender division of labor, we know that uh, most of the social reproduction work or the care economy is managed by the women 
and the productive economy, so called production economy is managed by the uh, men. This at least this is the general conception or the assumptions that, uh, um, that we base our uh, analysis on. And with regard to what are the uh, gender needs arising because of these uh, customary, uh, because of this, because of this customary gender division of labor is what is addressed by uh, practical gender needs. Uh, strategic gender needs on the other hand reflect a challenge to the customary gender relations and imply changes in relationships of power and control between women and men, where one challenge is that whether it is solely the responsibility of women to take care of the care economy or women's roles also enter into the production economy, uh, community management and so on and so forth. So, these are things that are addressed by these different approaches. Now, let us uh, look at uh, this uh, slide from left to right starting with the origins of these uh, approaches. Now, when we look at it from the welfareist perspective, the earliest approach was that of the residual model of social welfare under colonial administration, uh, focus on modernization, accelerated growth, economic development model, which meant that as economic growth takes place, as economic development takes pl take place, every person in the society would benefit out of it irrespective of whether they are men or women and children. Uh, however, uh, when we move to the concept of equity, the original uh, women in development approach found itself uh, facing uh, various challenges, particularly with respect to the failure of modernization, influence of Bozerup and first world feminists on Percy Amendment, declaration of UN decade for women. These are all issues that uh, tried to address these challenges, because increasingly it was seeing that economic growth. Uh, or the top down approaches of development or, and growth have not benefited women equally as uh, they would have done uh, the men folk. With respect to anti poverty, the second uh, women in development approach toned down equity because of criticism and it linked to redistribution with growth and basic needs. Uh, efficiency third and now prominent predominant women in development approach is deterioration in world economy and empowerment most recent approach arouse out, arose out of the failure of equity approach, third world women's feminist writing and grassroots organizations. Uh, now, what was the period in which it was most formal, uh, popular? The 1950s to 1970s, uh, it was most popular, the welfare approach was most popular, but it is still widely used. Uh, between 1975 and 85, there were attempts to adopt it during and since uh, women's decade. 1970s onwards, uh, the, it was there was still limited popularity post 1980s, which is now the most popular approach, and 1975 onwards accelerated during uh, it accelerated during during 1980s and still limited popularity empowerment issues. With respect to purpose, uh, uh, the welfareist approach tried to bring women into development as better mothers. Uh, the equity approach to gain equity for women in the development process. Anti-poverty focused on ensuring that poor women increase their productivity. Therefore, you would see a number of anti-poverty programs during the uh, during uh, doing the rounds of the uh, during the during the decades of the 1980s, particularly where the focus, uh, for example, the microfinance institutions, microcredit, and so on, where the focus was on ensuring that poor women increase productivity, and that is how they will be uh, they will be pulled out of the situation of poverty. Efficiency to ensure development is more efficient and effective and empowerment to empower women through greater self-reliance. Uh, with, with, with respect to the issue of uh, needs of women uh, met and roles recognized, so to meet uh, practical gender needs in reproductive role, uh, the welfareist tradition focused on uh, meeting practical gender needs in reproductive role relating particularly to food aid, malnutrition and family planning. The equity approach focused more on strategic gender needs in terms of triple roles directly through sta state top down intervention giving political and economic autonomy by reducing inequality with men. Anti poverty tried to meet uh, uh, practical gender needs in productive role to earn an income particularly in small scale income generating projects. The efficiency approach. Uh, tried to meet uh, practical gender needs in context of declining social services by relying on all three roles of women and elasticity of women's time. And therefore, there was a lot of focus during this period, the early 1990s 
on time burden, time poverty, time use surveys and so on. And with respect to empowerment to uh, there was a, there was an effort to reach uh, strategic gender needs in terms of triple role indirectly through bottom up mobilization around practical gender needs as means to confront oppression. So, this is basically a very um, uh, a, a complex framework within which this needs to be analyzed, but this is how the um, this is how in a uh, in a, a very crudely put. Uh, various approaches with respect to women in development and gender and development has progressed over the period of last three or four decades. Now, let us uh, come to the issue of uh, gender analysis and approaches to gender mainstreaming. Now, what is the purpose of gender analysis? Uh, let us begin with this question. The purpose of gender analysis is to understand the mechanism underlying both dominant development problems and policy program and project interventions in terms of their implications for women and men and for the relationship between them. I have already stated in the beginning that uh, when we are looking at gender analysis, we are obviously looking at gender disaggregated information and how men and women are affected differently because of certain interventions, because of certain policies or because of a certain situation. So, now let us have a look at what are the gender mainstreaming elements. Uh, they may be um, uh, summarized as uh, follows, uh, they are showing on your slide. So, uh, some, of, some of the elements are as follows, one is clear policies and priorities of goals at the national and interna intervention levels. It is very important that what is the gender policy, what is the priority with regard to, uh, to, to uh, different sexes. Uh, is made very clear the agenda is set at the national level and at also at the international levels. Uh, for example, with respect to nutrition, uh, it is often uh, considered to be the prerogative of women uh, as to whether their children are well fed or and schooled or not. And therefore, you would see that uh, I have taken numerous examples of complementary feeding practices all throughout this course. And you would see that the focus mostly is on women. If women are better educated, children are better, uh, better nourished and so on. So, this is, this is the uh, link that is established th which means that women's role or prerogative with regard to uh, their uh, existence in the care economy is again reinforced by the fact that children will, will be well nourished only if women are well educated. So, uh, and therefore, it at the policy level, now this is, this is uh, a stereotypical assumption that is made with respect to women, but at the policy level that means the agenda is fixed that the focus on uh, women or focus the priority with regard to the goal of uh, better nutrition among children also means that uh, girl children should go to school so that, so that they can be better mothers. Now, uh, uh, irrespective of whether we agree with this notion or not, but this is how the uh, national agenda is fixed. Secondly, gender mainstreaming strategies and gender analysis methods, uh, a reasonable level of gender analysis specific to an intervention, one or more clear goals relating to changes in gender equality, some means of monitoring and reporting on the changes in gender equality with identifiable link to intervention dialogue between a development agency and its partners, civil society organizations, etc. Some of the other elements here are uh, C resources and capacity that is again very important. So, human resources, gender equality training, gender analysis tools. So, with respect to human resources, we have internal or they may be internal or external to an organization uh, making optimal use of national local gender expertise. Uh, so, um, when I am referring to uh, gender expertise here or uh, human resources internal or external to an organization, when designing policy interventions with respect to let us say nutrition, while on the one hand the framework is very important, what is the framework that we are following at the national level, so as to meet the outcomes of nutrition among children, nutrition among mothers or women and so on whether we are looking at women only as mothers or whether we are looking at women also as individuals also sets the context of the nutrition policy. Now, if the, if the focus is entirely on ensuring that uh, children are well fed, children are well nourished uh, because uh, children are the ultimate resources for the economy in future 
and we are a growing economy and therefore we must have uh, well fed and healthy children now the focus if the focus is only on this and also we assume that uh, we have already established this link and assume that if women are better educated there would be better outcomes for children then essentially what we are trying to see here is the role of women only as mothers as better mothers so that uh, their education then becomes the instrument through which children become better nourished so in this sense then gender expertise also matters a lot with regard to where they want the weight to be on uh, and and this is the importance of human resources in this context gender equality training for own and partner agency staff general issues on gender including new topics such as masculinities and femininities gender analysis tools for example we may have gender analytical frameworks checklists handbooks etc uh, stakeholder analysis and identification of factors example who are the beneficiaries who will be the partner agencies coordination offices consultants so uh, similarly with the same example of nutrition outcomes with regard to children when we are uh, designing an intervention and we are in uh, we are trying to execute an intervention it is essential it is uh, it is very important with regard to identification of who will be the beneficiaries who will be the partnering agencies through which this intervention will take place how will be the who will be the uh, where will be the coordination offices and so on and so forth institutional arrangements mechanisms for promoting gender equality from the national to the local program example gender units gender focal points etc and lastly sex disaggregated data and information is paramount to assessing change in gender equality which is why in various national level reports within india itself you would see that much of the data is disaggregated by sex by male female uh, and uh, also by uh, children that helps us to assess the change in gender equality that has taken place however much remains to be done in this area now uh, let us have a look at some of the gender analytical frameworks that exist this has been uh, uh, summed up in this table under three heads the framework what is the focus of the framework and what are what are the tools that are used to address the focus of these frameworks uh for uh, number 1 uh, these are these are these are just a few examples i am sure there are a number of uh, more frameworks that have been added to such analysis with time and that the uh, students may also consider so let us begin with the harvard analytical framework now this is a framework where the focus is on resource allocations for women and men and it is done with the help of certain tools for example the activity profile so the activity profile of women and men are uh, jotted down and then access and control profile to resource and benefits for women and men and what are the influencing factors these are uh, jotted down and then an anal analysis is done with respect to resource allocations for women and men another framework is uh, people oriented planning now this is basically an adaptation of the harvard analytical framework for use in refugee situations and the tools are refugee population profile and context analysis activities analysis which is more or less the same uh, um, similar tool that is used in the harvard analytical framework use of resources analysis and adaptation of harvard uh, tool 2 uh, to, which is access and control uh, profile a uh, women socio political profile compared to men's and so on uh, you also have a moser framework where uh, the focus is on three concepts uh, women's triple role which is the reproductive or the or what i'm referring to as social reproduction or the care economy the productive and the community work so women when they're involved in the care economy refer to as social reproduction women when they're involved in production of um, uh, product or the productive economy let us say in agricultural commodities or in small scale industry and so on and women involved in community management or community work so this is what we are referring to as the women's triple role and what are the tools that help us analyze uh, these uh, concepts gender roles identification the triple role gender needs assessment disaggregating control of resources and decision making we also have gender analysis matrix where the focus is on uh, determining the different impact uh, development interventions have on women and men so here the analysis of four levels of society which means that we are carrying out the analysis of interventions 
uh, on the impact that the interventions have on women, men, household and the community. Uh, analysis of four kinds of impact through labor, time, resources, socio-cultural factors. We also have uh, capacities and vulnerabilities analysis framework. Here the focus is to help in planning aid in emergencies and to meet immediate needs. And the tools are categories of um, capabilities and vulnerabilities, additional dimensions of complex uh, reality. Similarly, the women's empowerment framework here the focus is on analyzing equality by sectors, but concentrates on separate areas of social life. So, measuring levels of equality, women's empowerment, social relations approach here the focus is on analysis existing uh, gender inequalities in distribution of resources, responsibilities and power. And the framework is for conceptualizing the tools used are, are frameworks for conceptualizing, studying and implementing empowerment, SEN inspired framework, ability to exercise choice, resources, agency and achievements. Again, I have tried to summarize most of these gender analytical frameworks into just one table, which is a very complex exercise. And uh, it would be in the interest of the students to pick up on each one of these frameworks and look into the details of how the tools are used. I have provided references at the end of this uh, lesson, which can be used by the students uh, to uh, look up each of these frameworks and see which of these frameworks are more suitable for your area of research. As I keep saying that the context setting is very important. Uh, if you go back to the previous classes, you would see that the world views are very important. So, considering the world view that you are coming from and the context that you are working in, setting up your agenda of uh, your research becomes very important in deciding which framework you want, you would like to choose. Just to give you an example of the nutrition uh, story that I have been talking about, uh, from these uh, frameworks that I have, I might want to use the gender analysis uh, matrix because I want to look at the impact of uh, labor, time, resources and socio-cultural factors that contribute to the uh, nutrition uh, of children or the growth and monitoring of uh, children. Similarly, I might also want to look up, uh, you know, activity profile of the men and women in my study area that uh, contributes to nutrition among children or malnourishment among children. And I might also want to look up the social relations approach. So, depending upon the uh, story that you want to come up with, uh, when you are following your development research question, you might want to combine many of these analytical frameworks also. Uh, however, caution must be exercised with regard to how these mixing of analytical frameworks take place, because often the uh, agenda uh, uh, behind these uh, conceptual frameworks also are very different and we may not want to combine uh, frameworks which have uh, contesting and contrasting uh, agendas. It is also true that there are various uh, stereotypical assumptions uh, about uh, women's position in society and in the household. And uh, this is uh, largely prevalent in the area of development cooperation and international development. Now, and often when we are carrying out a gender analysis, it becomes very important to challenge these gender stereotypes. Now, let us have a look at some of the uh, gender stereotypes that are, uh, that are, uh, that are widely prevalent in, uh, among the gender analysts or also among the international agencies, international development cooperation practitioners and so on and so forth. And uh, how and what are the methodological challenges that we face because of these assumptions, because of the stereotypical assumptions um, there. So, this uh, slide here shows you the challenging uh, stereotype assumptions made by planners about the household. Often when we talk about the household uh, with respect to the structure of low income households, the assumption that is made is that it is a nuclear household. You have uh, a, a, a male head of the household, a female head of the household and the children. Therefore, most household surveys also have this question that who is the um, uh, head of the household, while the assumption often in the case of third world countries is also made that the head of the household has to be a male head of the household, but it need not necessarily be so. 
Uh, but these days many surveys have started making um, uh, started disaggregating this information by asking male head of the household and female head of the household. But again there are certain stereotypical assumptions here because we assume as a given that India has moved far ahead over the, over the period of last 3, 4 decades and therefore all families in this country are nuclear, but it need not be so. So, one of the first uh, um, assumptions with respect to the household particularly in the context of structure of low income households is the uh, nuclearity of the um, assumptions. And there are the empirical and methodological challenges that we face is high proportion of other household structures exist for example, extended families, women headed households and so on. So, the question that arises is that when we are speaking with respect to policy interventions or um, welfare interventions uh, trying to reach certain goals, we have goal oriented objectives with regard to nutrition outcomes let us say or health outcomes or education outcomes. And we, and we have started with the assumption of a nuclear family, then how are we dealing with the problems or how, how are we addressing the problems of other kinds of families which may also have a very high proportion of existence. So, second is with regard to the organization of tasks in the household, the assumption usually is that man is the breadwinner winner and the woman is a housewife. Whereas, you would see that women and men are involved in different roles depending on the gender division of labor in the context. And women particularly have multiple roles because of the reproductive, productive, community managing and community politics roles. Therefore, the uh, uh, very stereotypical and traditional notion of man as a breadwinner and woman as a housewife, when we start with this assumption and then when we collect the data and enter into our analysis, we face roadblocks. Because we would see that there are multiple roles that both men and women play in their daily lives and therefore, that needs to be contextualized in the case of the research question that you are following. Similarly, the issue of control of resources and decision making in the household. Now, uh, often the assumption is that there is equal access to resources, there is harmonious gender relations in the household and the household is therefore, treated as a unit. Most socio-economic surveys in the developing countries context you would see also in the context of the developed countries you would see household is taken as a unit of observation. We most national level survey agencies including the uh, national sample survey organization and so on also collect data at the household level. And the assumption here is that the and why would one uh, collect data at the household level because the assumption here is that resources are all equally distributed ac uh, across all members of the household. But if that is so, then why is it that the dependent so called dependent members of the household most particularly women and children always get a uh, get an unfair deal vis a vis the male members of the households. So, the challenges that we face are often there is unequal access to resources for different household members, gender relations are often conflicting and therefore, there is a need for disaggregation of the household. One needs to look at men, women and children separately. One needs to uh, differentiate individuals within the household by age, by marital status. We may have extended members of the family staying within a family and therefore, disaggregation within the household also becomes uh, an important factor in trying to explain the question that we are following. Okay, now, let us move on to some uh, looking up some gender sensitive indicators uh, with respect to poverty and power. Uh, again, here I will not enter into the details of these indicators, I will only flag off or mention the names of some of these indicators and let me also inform that the uh, details regarding these indicators are all um, available in public forums these days, they are very easily accessible and uh, students who are interested in looking up uh, into the details of each of these indicators can very well look into by going through the, uh, the references that I have mentioned at the end of this uh, class course. So, uh, disaggregating core human development indicators by sex and composing various gender related indices. I have just mentioned that uh, sex disaggregated data or gender disaggregated data becomes very important because there are challenges empirical and methodological challenges to these assumptions that we stick on to. So, in this context various gender related indices have already come up 
Now, for example, the one of the most famous ones is the UNDP's Human Development Report uh, guided GDI or the Gender Related Development Index. And in similar lines, we have various other gender develop gender indices. Uh, apart from GDI, we have gender empowerment measure, which used to be uh, there earlier, and these days have been overridden by the gender development index. You have gender inequality in education, gender inequality in economic activity, work burden and time allocation, women's political participation and so on. Work burden and time allocation has uh, come to the center of uh, much analysis where the focus is on time poverty and how much time uh, women and men spend on leisure and how that affects their levels of health and nutrition and education and overall conditions of living and so on. Uh, work on a, a gender informed poverty analysis is prompted by ongoing work to monitor the erstwhile millennium development goals and now the sustainable development goals and various poverty reduction strategy papers have come up. In order to integrate gender into poverty diagnostic stage of uh, the poverty reduction strategy, it is a step to generate data on four dimensions of poverty opportunity, what are the opportunities that women have, what are the capabilities that women have such that they can be actors of dev actors in the development space or they can be agents of development in the uh, development space, security, empowerment. A study of gender dimensions of poverty and their measurement would also help us inform an ongoing non-conclusive debate on the relationship between poverty and gender inequality. Now, the required studies both at the macro and micro level are difficult to undertake as access to documentation of gender disaggregated context is rather limited and the shifting policy approaches to women in development reflect contesting perspectives of what are relevant gender sensitive or women specific interventions. When it comes to understanding power and power relations between women and men, the influential analysts in the context of developing countries particularly are Naila Kabir and Joe Rollins and it is, uh, it will be interesting to look up their work for the sake, uh, for the uh, research work of our uh, students here. Now, there are different forms of power obviously in order to understand empowerment. Uh, some of the uh, uh, very important ones uh, cited uh, that, that I have cited here from Rowlands are power over uh, what, power to, power with and power from within. So, power over uh, which, is, which, which is basically talking about controlling power which may be responded to with compliance, resistance or manipulation. Power to generative or productive power which creates new possibilities and actions without domination. Power with which is a sense of the whole being greater than the sum of the individuals. Power from within, uh, the spiritual strength and uniqueness, its basis is self acceptance and self respect. So, there are three dimensions to exploring empowerment, personal, relational, collective. Personal power, uh, you could talk about women's autonomy within the household, women's decision making powers within the households. Relational, women's decision making power with respect to men, uh, women's decision making power uh, in a certain household with respect to women's decision making power in some other households because of the differences in uh, power and position privileges across households and collective where for example, women's collectives coming together and then uh, carrying out certain interventions within the community and how that leads to different degrees of empowerment. Uh, these are uh, some of the dimensions of poverty and uh, indicators uh, that can uh, address these dimensions of poverty and the measurements. Um, this is a very useful classification that can come in handy for people who are interested in uh, uh, gender analysis of the research question. So, the dimension of uh, opportunities, the indicators are time budget and time poverty, employment and labor force participation, capital and assets. The measurements that we follow are usually based upon household surveys, focus groups and direct observation methods, <coughs> household and labor market surveys, household surveys, records of credit and finance institutions for capital and assets. Uh, for the dimension of capabilities, the indicators are demographic indicators, for example, infant mortality, life expectancy, etc., education, health and nutrition, qualitative indicators of capabilities, culture, freedom, autonomy. So, these demographic indicators basically tell us 
how uh, because they build capabilities of uh, being able to access information, access resources. If you are alive, you are able to access resources. If you are better educated, you are able to get a job. If you are healthy, you are able to grow your own food. So, therefore, these are certain indicators that can help us measure capabilities of men and women within the gender space that we are studying. And uh, the measurements can range from household and health surveys, clinic records, anthropometric studies, national and stat uh, sectoral statistical records, uh, school records, uh, health and nutrition data can be taken from household surveys, school records, uh, qualitative indicators of culture, freedom and autonomy can be done through uh, focus group discussions, participant observations, national quality of life surveys and so on. Similarly, with respect to the dimension of uh, poverty on security, the indicators could be economic vulnerability, which can be measured through household surveys, focus groups, PRAs, uh, such as timelines and periods of stress and diaries. Uh, for example, uh, we have currently in Assam, because of the National Register uh, for Citizens, uh, various organizations have now come up with. Uh, a uh, very uh, vulnerability analysis by carrying out surveys from door to door, uh, looking up uh, the periods of stress that people face uh, because of uh, not being counted as part of the NRC. Uh, similarly, exposure to violence, this can be done through focus groups, participant observations, case studies, social capital, uh, household surveys, inter-household and transfer studies and so on. Empowerment could be with respect to political empowerment or control over household resources, what I was referring to as autonomy of women within the household. This can be again done through household service, informants, key informant interviews, participant observation, focus group and so on. Now, let us uh, try and end today's lesson with some of the some, some uh, major points with regard to uh, the arguments posed by uh, the proponents of uh, gender mainstreaming and uh, women's empowerment. So, there are two uh, contesting perspectives here, mainstreaming of uh, gender mainstreaming and women's empowerment. The focus should be on what? Should be on gender mainstreaming or women's empowerment. And of course, they are contesting perspectives and they are inconclusive also. So, uh, let us look at some of the arguments posed by proponents of gender mainstreaming. One, it is critical to effectively use the global goals and recommendations for action and development cooperation. They also feel that it is important to improve the focus on legally binding commitments to international conventions. For example, the convention on all forms of discrimination against women. It is also important to distinguish between general development problems and challenges specifically relating to promotion of gender equality. And the areas where change is needed, they think is on gender equality policies, institutional arrangements, sharpening policy dialogue and sector approaches updating methodologies and tools, etcetera. The proponents of women's empowerment say that there, is a dis there needs to be discussion on how to understand women's situation. Women's empowerment is central in this discourse and the argument against gender mainstreaming is that gender mainstreaming is a policy adopted from above and progress in this matter will depend entirely on committed individuals. If in the hierarchy of people who want to mainstream gender or gender uh, or mainstream uh, gender agendas, if the people themselves in the hierarchy are not committed to this, then it will never happen. And therefore, they uh, posit uh, women's empowerment as a contesting idea with respect to gender mainstreaming. And uh, many of these arguments hold true, particularly if you look at the gender budgeting exercises uh, that take place. Uh, where often the gender budgeting exercises are either, either half hearted or uh, not done very systematically. Similarly, gender agenda is often sidelined as a result of ambiguous strategies with particular implications for women's empowerment. And therefore, this discourse represents different theoretical and political points of departure and structure and agency play a very important role here. I will end today's lesson with Nayla Kabir's conceptualization of uh, empowerment that is showing, showing on your uh, slide here. Uh, as I have said, structure and agency play a very important role. Now, Kabir's conceptualization of empowerment uh, suggests that it can reflect change at a number of different policy uh, levels. So, you have deeper levels, which is structural relations of class, caste, gender. There are intermediate levels 
which is institutional rules and resources and immediate levels, individual resources, agency and achievement. Uh, Kabir uh, takes example of the Egyptian researcher Kishore who has used uh, national data to explore the uh, effects of uh, direct and indirect measures of women's empowerment on two valued functioning achievements. One is infant survival rates and infant immunization. Since women have uh, bore primary responsibility for children's health, she hypothesized that their empowerment would be associated with positive achievement in terms of health and survival of their children. So, her analysis relied on three categories of uh, composite indicators to measure empowerment. One was direct evidence of empowerment, second was sources of empowerment and third was a setting for empowerment. So, these uh, can be summarized as is showing on your slide here together with the variables which had greatest weight in each indicator of empowerment. So, the indicator direct evidence of empowerment, the variables with greatest weight are devaluation of women based upon the reports of domestic violence, dowry, parent, marriage, etc. Women's em uh, emancipation, example belief in daughter's education, freedom of movement, reported sharing of roles in decision making, egalitarian gender roles, egalitarian decision making, equality in marriage, for example, fewer grounds reported for justified divorce by husbands, financial autonomy or currently controls her earnings. Similarly, sources of empowerment, uh, the variables with greatest weight can be participation in the modern sector, example, index of assets owned, female education, you could also add uh, land titles to it, uh, particularly let us say in the Indian context, uh, you could add land titles in the name of uh, women, lifetime exposure to uh, employment, uh, whether, whether the uh, women in question worked before marriage, whether they are working after marriage, controlled earnings before marriage, after marriage, setting indicators, uh, the variables with greatest weight are family structure, amenable to empowerment, marital advantage, traditional marriage. With respect to family structure, amenable to empowerment, example, uh, does um, does not now or previously live with in-laws, marital advantage, small age difference between spouses, chose husband, whether the, uh, con the woman concerned had some autonomy with respect to the choice of the spouse that is being made, traditional marriage, whether, whether there are large educational difference with husband or uh, did not have any autonomy with respect to the choice of husband. So, the, the results of a multivariate analysis found that the uh, indirect source or setting indicators of women's empowerment had far more influence in determining the value of her achievement variables than the direct measures. It was found uh, with the help of a multivariate analysis that these are the indicators which uh, seem to have a very important uh, uh, influence in determining the value of her achievement variables. There may be several explanations which are beyond the scope of uh, today's lesson for explaining how and why these uh, uh, the, the setting indicators had more influence on the nutrition indicators than others uh, and uh, this can be uh, explored in more detail by the students by linking up all of these information that I have provided with the help of this class. Uh, because these are at the central, these, these, these issues are at the center of operationalizing uh, these concepts in this entire uh, co uh, question with respect to uh, development research and how we analyze them given keeping in mind the, uh, the context setting, the agenda setting and the world views that we have been discussing so far. So, let us end today's class with these references that I have used for this lecture. Uh, the primary uh, material for this class came from Britha Mikkelsen's Methods for Development Work and Research. Uh, this is a highly recommended book for any student who wants to uh, look up more issues on operationalizing development research methods. Uh, however, I have also added on uh, materials uh, from uh, Naila Kabir, for example, where she talks about resources, agency achievements and reflections on measurement of women's empowerment. You are also um, requested to go through the uh, references by Joe Rowland on empowerment, uh, questioning empowerment, 
And for a comprehensive literature on the topics covered in this lecture, I also suggest that students go through the reference list of all the above cited papers. I hope you have uh, got uh, some information about how to operationalize gender issues uh, when uh, pursuing your development research question. However, this is an inconclusive uh, lesson in the sense that it is not possible for us to cover all of those uh, topics in this uh, class. Uh, however, those interested may put up questions on the portal which I will take up. Thank you and see you in the next class.